All right. So today I'm going to continue to talk about aspects of um, innate immunity, particularly thinking about um, the cellular aspects of innate immunity. I will warn you, a bunch of stuff in t today's class is related to my research. Um, and I will be working hard to hold myself back from being way too into a couple things. Um, but let me tell you, if you have questions, I'm so excited to answer them. Um, so uh, what you should remember from last time is that we were talking about um, the general inflammatory response. Um, and right now we're talking about sort of the positive physiological purposes of this inflammatory response, um, which we know of as a response to either infection, tissue injury, or tissue stress. Um, I will actually say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, that will allow for defense, repair, um, and restoration of homeostasis. And we talked through um, some steps of this process of this general inflammatory response um, leading to um, the four cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, and pain. And we were kind of talking through individual events that were happening in this response. Um, so specifically, we saw um, a macrophage that was in the tissue, in this case, in the skin, um, that was able to recognize a microbe using a pattern recognition receptor, and then transcribe inflammatory cytokines. Um, the specific cytokines I called out um, last time were IL-1 beta and IL-6 and TNF. I'm, I think I maybe didn't actually mention IL-1 beta, but so those are the inflammatory cytokines that I specified. Um, and then we see the physiologic changes like vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, recruitment of cells into the tissue, all that good stuff. Um, we left off last time talking about those cells that tend to come into that site of inflammation, which are the neutrophils. Um, and I'll say a bit more about the neutrophils um, as we go. So that's kind of where I'm going to pick up. Um, however, before I pick up with the neutrophil, um, someone asked a really interesting question um, after class um, that I wanted to sort of bring up. Um, it also actually relates to another rabbit hole of immunology that I'm going to mention and just point out and say, we don't know how that works <laughs> because it is a little bit of an issue. But every so often a student will think of it and I'll be like, yeah, you're right. But um, so someone actually was asking me about acne <laughs> um, and pus. And in fact, yeah, that is this exact same process. You're just having bacteria get into a pore you're getting cytokine production, you're getting an influx of fluid and neutrophils that's leading to that pimple getting big and painful and swollen um, because you are having those neutrophils come in to get rid of um, any particular microbes. And so any particular situation that you can think of that sort of is that inflammation process is exactly this. There was some cell that recognized some microbe associated molecular pattern and started this exact process just in whatever anatomic location you can think of. Um, the rabbit hole part is that there are some other situations that you could think of where inflammation also occurs. 
Um, and these are situations, and again, every so often somebody will ask me about this. And I'll be like, uh. Um, because they pose a little bit of a problem to this whole scheme. We have a very big picture understanding, but there are a lot of details we don't know the answer to. Um, so let's imagine that after class, um, I am running around trying to get stuff done, and I trip and fall down the stairs, walking back to my office, and twist my ankle. What's going to happen to my ankle? It's going to get swollen. Probably going to get red. Probably going to maybe be a little warm. It, it, my ankle's going to get inflamed, right? Is there any, are there any microbes in my ankle at that moment? No, I, I like twisted my ankle. I did not like cut it open and let microbes in. So what the heck <laughs> is this macrophage sensing <laughs> to start this whole process? The end of this process when I twist my ankle is exactly this. What the heck did the macrophage sense <laughs> to start it off? What we have realized is that um, we also have the ability not just to sense bacteria, but to sense tissue damage. Um, and so just like you saw on this slide, um, sometimes when we see things like tissue injury, we will actually um, be able to sense tissue injury using molecules that are the same as or very similar to those PRRs. Um, I told you about MAMPs, microbe-associated molecular pattern that are sensed in the case of microbial infection. In the case of this thing that I'm, that's called sterile inflammation, um, where there's no microbe, like when I twist my ankle, um, we talk about DAMPs, damage-associated molecular patterns. Um, but a lot of it is otherwise the same kind of process. Um, there's a lot that we don't totally understand about the DAMP process, but um, for uh, since that question usually comes up at some point, yes, that is still inflammation. No, there is no microbe. But yes, it is basically the same process. We're just sensing something slightly different at this sensing stage. Um, we left off last time, of course, with the neutrophils coming into the area and killing the invading bacteria. And um, before we kind of talk about a little bit more detail about that, um, I want to show you a little video of neutrophils um, doing their job. Part of this is because I think I saw this video um, an unbelievable number of times as a student, and uh, it feels wrong to not show it to you after having seen it an unbelievable number of times. Um, you will find this video all over YouTube. Um, in fact, you can find it set to pretty much any music that you want. Um, so what's going to be happening in this video um, when I uh, unpause it is that we're going to be looking at our neutrophil, which is this cell here. And it's going to be um, following some bacteria, some staph that are uh, shown here. These are red blood cells, which are actually contaminants in the prep. Um, so they're not really supposed to be there, but in the end, they kind of look like fun obstacles um, in the video. And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a neutrophil actually go ahead and perform phagocytosis of these um, bacteria. What I want you to know is how much um, directed movement the neutrophil does towards those bacteria, as well as when the neutrophil finally does phagocytosis. Um, how much of a cytoskeletal and structural rearrangement the cell undergoes. I will also tell you there is another video um, just when I, I, that I found when I was teaching cell bio of uh, phagocytosis in general of an amoeba phagocytosing a paramecium. Um, and I don't show that anymore. It shows some great stuff about phagocytosis, um, but I don't show it anymore in class because I actually had someone start crying in the middle of class for the for poor paramecium. Um, it like really freaked them out. So I don't show that one anymore. Hopefully we won't worry about the poor bacteria here. Um, yeah, and if you ever want to look for this, this is on YouTube with the COPS theme or the Benny Hill theme or any other ridiculous theme that you might like to see. So um, here is our neutrophil. So 
you can see that neutrophil is able to completely directionally follow those bacteria. Um, there's actually quite a lot going on. At one point in this video, uh, the neutrophil actually goes close to some other bacteria, not the one it was chasing, um, and it can't really pivot. So it has to f keep chasing the one it was instead of um, trying to go for the other one. You can also see um, So, so here you can see it's going to go really close to this one, but it can't actually pivot to, to change which uh, bacteria it is chasing. You can also now watch the neutrophil. Finally, there we go. Um, actually envelop that bacteria um, and lead to total degradation of that. And so when we talk about neutrophils kind of being like Pac-Man, they kind of are like Pac-Man and that's actually what it looks like. Yep, Jameer. So, I'm sorry. so do the bacteria like have receptors that know when different cells are closer to it that it doesn't want to be near? <laughs> um, so in the video, it looks like that bacteria is running away. <laughs> um, but that is actually not really what's going on. The bacteria is not actively um, running away from pursuit. Um, that is really just sort of the brownian motion in the video. So unfortunately, fortunately, I guess for us, um, the bacteria are not directionally trying to run away. <laughs> um, Carrie May, did you have a question? Well, so, so that means that you killed the bacteria and you now have resolved this inflammation and the inflammation will stop. Okay. Alternatively, if you know, it, it bursts, it's because you don't have enough space for all of the influx of uh, things that are coming in. Um, so um, here we can see the specific details of that neutrophil. Um, killing the bacteria. So you can see that the bacteria is going to be phagocytosed based on the neutrophil um, recognizing with some specific receptors. Remember that our neutrophils are granulocytes and have lots of different granules in them. And those granules will fuse with the phagosome. That will deliver um, acid. Um, that will also deliver a bunch of different um, reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species and a bunch of different enzymes that will degrade that bacteria. Um, and then um, in the end, that neutrophil will die and will get phagocytosed by a macrophage to recycle different components of the cell. The macrophage will use it as nutrients. And we see you know, those collections of dead neutrophils um, as pus. Um, it's probably after a few. Um, so yeah, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so when we talked about this on Wednesday, um, I did a little bit of a compare and contrast with neutrophils and macrophages. And I said, and again, remember, of course, I work with macrophages, so I may be a bit biased. Um, I said that sometimes we think of neutrophils as like the dumb ones. The macrophages have, you know, bonus features. The macrophages can do phagocytosis and they have those PRRs so that they can do transcription and make inflammatory cytokines. The macrophages, they just do Pac-Man stuff. However, we have learned about one additional function that neutrophils have that seems to be really important. So neutrophils do have their own bonus function. It's not using PRRs and making cytokines, but it is doing something else. It is kind of cool too, so I'll give them that. Um, and it actually has to do with the neutrophil's death and how the neutrophil dies. Because what we have learned is that when that neutrophil dies, it makes a specific structure. Um, 
known as a neutrophil extracellular trap, um, which is usually referred to as a net, a neutrophil net. And saying neutrophil net is kind of like saying ATM machine, because you're there's a, the M in ATM already stands for machine, so you're like double saying machine. The N in net stands for neutrophil, but we still call it a neutrophil net, so like you're double saying neutrophil. Um, and this process of producing uh, neutrophil nets um, while dying is known as netosis. So what you can see here is that neutrophil having some granules, it is having those granules um, come together to help destroy that uh, microbe, and then our neutrophil is dying. But when that neutrophil is dying, it actually takes its DNA and chromatin and a bunch of other things and throws it out of the cell like a net to be this sticky extracellular substance to potentially catch any type of microbes that are outside of cells. So this also helps it not be a one-to-one -one thing because that neutrophil can also, as it's dying, throw out this substance that can trap other microbes before they get into cells. Uh, and so you can actually see some examples of neutrophil nuts here. So these are E. coli caught up in the DNA and chromatin of neutrophils in neutrophil nets. You can see um, some cells in a neutrophil net here as well. So you can kind of think of neutrophils as being a little bit like Spider-Man in throwing out a bunch of nets to catch ba bad guys. So they have this additional ability as they're dying to use their intracellular components to trap bacteria so that those bacteria cannot further um, go in and uh, attack more cells. So it is a pretty good function, just not the function I usually think about. Um, if you went and asked people about inflammation, um, you would not necessarily hear positive things. I'm going to switch this order. Um, this is kind of the good side of inflammation. This is what inflammation should look like. We might have a situation where we have an injury on the hand, say we get a cut in the skin. We're going to have um, the macrophages, say, in that skin making uh, cytokines. That's going to lead to some changes in the blood vessel just here in the skin. And that's going to help us get rid of those bacteria and then have the skin of our hand be happily ever after. Um, so this is kind of our local inflammation process. But as, you, as we also know, um, inflammation can have pathological consequences if it goes wrong. So yeah, it's a really good thing. If you couldn't do inflammation, you'd be done for. But if inflammation goes wrong, we can start to have a number of different disease states happening. And that's where inflammation sort of gets um, its bad rap from. I'm going to show you a couple of different examples of more problematic inflammation here. One of them is sort of a spin-off from this figure, which is why I have this figure here. So here you're seeing this nice local inflammatory response in the skin of the hand. However, let's imagine now that we don't have bacteria in the skin of your hand. Let's imagine that you have bacteria in the blood, reproducing in the bloodstream. Now, if we were going to have to draw on the person where inflammation should be occurring, we're not gonna draw just a red hand. We're gonna realize that there's probably gonna be inflammation going on body-wide because the blood's everywhere and the bacteria is everywhere. So we're gonna be making that response absolutely everywhere. When that happens, we're going to have blood vessels throughout the entire body that are gonna change their diameter. We're gonna have blood vessels throughout the entire body that are gonna become leaky. When you have 
all of the blood leaking out of vessels, what's that going to do to the vessels? Don't overthink. What happens to the vessels if they are all, your whole body's blood vessels are leaky? Yeah? OK, permeability increases. Then what, but what happens to you? What goes on with your vessels? What's the res like end result to the vessels? They will expand, but then the blood will come out, and there will be no more blood in the vessels because it all leaked, <laughs> right? Suddenly, you're going to just have fluid everywhere, and your blood vessels are going to be empty. Those blood vessels can start to collapse. Um, we're going to have the wrong amounts of protein in the blood. We're going to have the wrong amounts of fluid everywhere, systemic swelling. You're going to have decreased blood volume, which is going to cause havoc in your cardiovascular system. All sorts of bad things are going to happen because you're getting leaky blood vessels throughout the body. You also may get um, coagulation in places that you don't end up, uh, that you shouldn't have. And that usually is going to lead to multiple organ failure and potentially death. Um, this process of inflammation happening throughout the blood is known as sepsis or septic shock. Um, it is actually a very common reason why people die when they go to the hospital. And there's very little, if anything, we can do about it. Um, this, the, you could imagine that the more we knew about this inflammatory response and the more we could control its signaling, the more we could potentially stop these types of processes. Um, so some of, I'm actually going to tell you about some things that won the Nobel Prize in a little bit. Um, there were some Nobel Prizes given for our understanding of PRRs in 2011. And a lot of it was because of the potential promise of dealing with um, septic shock, um, among many other things. Um, so septic shock is kind of the most famous effect. But if you recall, outside of local inflammation, I also told you that our inflammatory cytokines had some effects on other parts of the body. So remember I said they can affect the liver, and the liver will make some new proteins. They can affect the muscles, and the muscles will change their metabolism, so you can have a fever. It'll affect the brain, so you have some metabolic changes. It'll affect, um, again, you see vessels here. I, so I mentioned kind of some of those other effects. Again, if you have, say, a fever for a short period of time, that's OK. It's bad for the bacteria. It's not great for you. But you'll get over it, and you, you go back to normal. If you suddenly had a fever forever for your whole life, that would be really bad for you. And similar types of changes induced by some of these um, inflammatory cytokines um, can have other kinds of physiologic uh, issues as well. So if, for example, the heart muscle gets too much of an inflammatory cytokine, and usually this is more about how long, so it's getting inflammatory cytokine every day for like years instead of just that one day when you had the bacterial infection, then we're going to change the heart's output. Um, we're going to see general changes in the blood vessel if, we, if those blood vessels are getting hit with inflammatory cytokines for long periods of time. We can see changes in the metabolism of muscle that could potentially, um, as those muscles are getting hit by inflammatory cytokines for a really long period of time. And so the problem is not inflammation itself. It, the problem is inflammation going on for a really long time, or chronic inflammation. If we have tissues that are experiencing these cytokines for longer periods of time, bad stuff can happen. Um, and so we have realized that chronic inflammation means that many of these cytokines are being made um, quite a lot. That can lead to things like cell death, scarring, extra blood vessel growth, um, weird cell proliferation, um, things like impaired uh, metabolic signaling, like insulin signaling. And so 
many different conditions have actually been shown to be linked to chronic inflammation. Inflammation happening too much or too long. Um, this is a very short list um, of things that have been tied to chronic inflammation. Um, so heart disease or atherosclerosis because of the effects of those cytokines on the heart or on the vessels. Um, organ failure, cancer, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease, autoinflammatory disease, inflammatory bowel disease, allergy, asthma, transplant rejection, type 2 diabetes. Basically, if you can think of it, I can tie it to inflammation um, and a chronic inflammatory state. And we might wonder, well, why in the world might people experience chronic inflammation? We think some of that may be um, infections that are lasting for a long time, or the fact that perhaps you make a weird response to the microbes that live in your body. Perhaps you have some, say, something going on with your genetics, so you don't respond to the microbes that live in your GI tract correctly, or some other um, interested sort of inappropriate response um, and so there could be a lot of sort of genetic causes um, we can also see a number of different uh, causes like environmental things uh, exposure to pollution more and more we're actually realizing that there are a number of different lipids that can signal through pattern recognition receptors and so dietary lipids um, as well as um, kind of fats seen in obese individuals actually can be leading to chronic inflammation. Um, I heard, I've heard some of the coolest talks I've ever heard about dietary lipid and chronic inflammation um, and people actually feeding mice different kinds of lipids and showing just eating certain lipids gives the mice inflammation. Um, and so by eating those types of things on the diet, one can lead to uh, chronic inflammation because you're getting too much stimulation of macrophages, too much production of the cytokines, and that's leading to these types of physiological changes. Yep. So type one diabetes is actually an autoimmune disease. Um, that is due to an, uh, a T cell issue um, that we will talk about more when we talk about autoimmune disease. <laughs> um, so this, we've been talking about this process of inflammation and this is the classic process of inflammation. Um, but there are some variants on this theme. One thing that I want to point out about sort of this very classic view of inflammation, is this is sort of often described as a process that's happening in response to bacterial infection. And it turns out there are some other kind of ways this can work out. And again, the one I'm gonna tell you is sort of the classic response to viral infection. Um, because these are things I think about a lot, I will tell you, yes, I am oversimplifying a lot of things right now. So we're gonna, so this is usually thought of as classic bacterial infection, but we need to think about classic viral infection a little bit too. So um, I wanna just show you briefly a couple of things to think about in terms of viral infection. So with a virus, you can see two different examples of viral infection here. The viruses usually come in contact with a receptor on the surface of the cell. And then all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. That means they have to get inside one of our cells to reproduce. They can't reproduce without one of our cells. And you can see two examples of this here. What you can also see is that in order to do that reproduction, the virus has to come apart and pieces have to come out. Um, generally, um, those pieces are the nucleic acid. And so you can see the virus has to get into the cell. Nothing's going to happen if the virus isn't in the cell. And we have to have the virus come apart and have nucleic acids come out. And then we're going to see replication and uh, transcription and translation and all that good stuff. Okay, so there are two problems with this scheme compared to our general process we saw before. Remember that the end goal 
in the process that we saw before was a neutrophil coming along and phagocytosing. Um, so if you have viruses sitting around outside of cells, phagocytosis isn't always the best way to deal with it because that's actually letting the virus into a cell. It's kind of letting them win. <laughs> so phagocytosis is not an awesome, there are times where phagocytosis is used, but it's not a great way to deal with this virus. Um, and alternatively, like, the macrophage is going to like phagocytosis skin cell that's replicating virus. Like, that's not a good way of dealing with this infected cell either. And if we look at this infected cell, there aren't really like a lot of unique viral things as targets. You know, there's not LPS or peptidoglycan. Um, mostly there's just some nucleic acid around. Um, so things get a little bit tricky um, with the virus infectious cycle. In 1957, um, there were some scientists who were trying to study this issue. And what they realized um, is that they could um, infect some cells with a virus. So they were uh, infecting chicken cells with influenza, I believe. And then they found out that the infected cells made magic stuff and, if you, and sent it outside of the cell. And so if they... So they had a cell, the cell got infected with a virus, and now that infected cell made some product. And that product, if you actually collected it and took it and put it on another cell, made it so this cell can't be infected by the virus. So somehow this stuff, this medical stuff that was being made by this first cell can go to a neighboring cell and prevent that cell from being infected by a virus. It in fact interfered with this cell being infected. And so they didn't know anything else about what was going on, so they called it interferon. <laughs> because it interfered. Um, and we now know about interferon as um, another really important type of cytokine. So these cytokines that I told you about, the TNF, the IL-6, the IL-1 beta, are sort of the classic bacterial response cytokines while interferon is the classic virus response cytokine. And we're going to talk about interferon here. Um, we now know that there are a bunch of types of interferon, um, shockingly creatively called types 1, 2, and 3. Um, and we're really only going to talk about type 1 right now. Type 2 is related to the adaptive immune response. Um, type 3 is related to um, barrier immune responses. But type 1 interferon, um, which is also interferon alpha or beta, uh, is made almost immediately after infection. So pretty much as soon as you're infected with a virus, you start making um, type 1 interferon. Um, and it's, in some cases, is you know, starting to go away by 10 hours after infection. Um, so this is interferon alpha and beta. Um, and so you can see this process here. We've got a cell that gets infected with a virus. There's not much we can do for this cell. We aren't going to go in with little tweezers and be like, I don't like this piece of nucleic acid, and I don't like this piece of nucleic acid, and I don't like this piece of nucleic acid. Once the cell has started this viral infectious cycle, it's kind of a goner. The big thing that we can do is we can prevent the neighbors from not getting infected too. And so that infected cell makes our type 1 interferon. 
that will signal through a receptor, the interferon receptor on an uninfected cell and bring that cell into an antiviral state so that that cell cannot be infected um, by uh, the virus. And so this is sort of the parallel process for uh, aspects of viral infection. Um, this is the view of it from your textbook. So you can see the virus is infecting the cell. You can see the cell is starting to make interferon. That interferon can then go and act on other cells to give them an antiviral state. Your textbook does correctly point out the first cell can get interfere can actually get changed by its own interferon. It can feed itself interferon. I'm not going to focus on that. I really like to think about it this way, <laughs> that the infected cell is saving its neighbor. It's saying, hey, neighbor, get ready. Stop, get ready to block potential viruses. Do something to block viruses. N nothing's going to help me anymore. Yep. Is there like, what's the system in the cell that's infected that alerts that? Great question. So, um, the way that this sort of part of this process is happening, um, I'll draw out here as well. Uh, it's going to look familiar all of a sudden, okay? There's going to be some kind of pattern recognition receptor that responds to some part of the virus. Now we're going to transcribe interferon, specifically interferon alpha or beta, type 1, and then secrete that interferon alpha or beta. Over here, we had a bacteria. It was binding to a PRR on our cell. and we're getting a transcriptional response, but we're transcribing TNF or IL-6. So it's actually the same big picture process of there's some PRR that recognizes the microbe and tells the cell a change it should make in transcription. The effect of what gene is transcribed is different. So in this case, it's TNF and IL-6. In this case, it's type 1 interferon, interferon alpha and beta, though I am dramatically oversimplifying. <laughs> yes? If the infected cell also saves itself, mm -hmm. interferon, yeah. ever For our purposes, I'm going to say no, because <laughs> um, that can take us down a really long and crazy <laughs> rabbit hole. So for our purposes, I'm going to say no. Um, so what you can realize here is that this antiviral state must be kind of cool. I mean, it allows you to not get infected with viruses. I showed you up there. Can't be infected. Um, and so we do, again, here, I usually think about it in the uninfected cell, not in the infected cell. Um, so what will happen is that we have this type 1 interferon. Either alpha or beta that is made. It's going to bind to the interferon receptor on the neighboring uninfected cell. And now we're going to get more changes in transcription in this cell. Specifically, this cell is going to start to make a group of proteins known as ISGs. It's going to be transcribing and translating ISGs. ISG stands for interferon stimulated gene. So if you get some interferon, you make the interferon stimulated gene. You make an ISG. So 
interferon binding to the receptor leads to the production of um, interferons or ISGs. Um, there are thousands of ISGs. And it, what we think is that the specific combination of ISGs that are made in response to a particular virus, say flu versus SARS-CoV-2, is super important. But we don't totally understand the patterns. Um, but we can sort of at least look and be like, the pattern is different a little bit. So like every virus has a unique combo of like number one, number 17, and number 53 versus number two, number 229, and number 2000 like whatever, <laughs> um, that get made. And that probably is really important. Um, they have th other aspects in common, like um, a similar promoter and things like that. But the thing that I want us to really think about is um, a little bit of the other piece of the antiviral state. So, um, so basically, we have our cells making interferon stimulated genes and that puts that's what we're going to transcribe our ISGs and that puts the cell into the antiviral state as you hear about this process there is one question that students often ask when they look at this um, so let's imagine you were in charge of designing the world and you came up with something like this. One thing that you might look at with the antiviral state and say like, you know, this is a bad idea. I, I think I don't like this system. Is there anything that, that you see on the, on the surface here that looks kind of dumb? Uh, uh, I have an idea. Why is it that this cell got infected? Why didn't we put this cell in the antiviral state from the beginning? Why didn't we just stop all the viruses totally and have everybody in the antiviral state and never get infected with viruses ever and all live happily ever after? Why is it that we only get the antiviral state turned on sometimes? Seems like a good idea to me to turn it on all the time, right? You see that the issue? So what you m should realize about this is that there's some cost to the antiviral state. There's a problem with the antiviral state. There's a reason why we can't have it on all the time. Um, because the antiviral state is not great for cells. It's not super healthy for cells. This is an example of how the antiviral state works. One of the things that could happen with an ISG, one of the things that can happen with the antiviral state is we can turn on this process with something called protein kinase R that inhibits translation. And we can say, ha ha, virus, you can't use my ribosomes for translation because I'm going to turn them off. So that stops the virus from reproducing in that cell. We have another protein um, with some others, IFITs, that also inhibit translation. Um, we have also have the, the MX proteins and OAS um, that eventually lead to mRNA degradation. Ha ha, virus, you can't reproduce in my cytoplasm because I'm going to cut up your mRNA. So you can see how the antiviral state could be antiviral and could keep this cell from allowing viruses to reproduce. Makes sense. But if you look at this slide, notice that this does not say inhibition of virus translation. It says inhibition of translation. 
the cell doesn't turn off some ribosomes to help to like not make virus stuff. The cell turns off all its ribosomes. It's good because the virus can't use them, but it's bad because the cell can't use them either. We're not just degrading viral mRNA, we're degrading all of the mRNA in the cell. Good because that's going to stop the virus. Bad because that's going to stop the cell from doing cellular processes. So the antiviral state is not a great state for the cell to be in. Um, it's going to stop viral infection, but it's not a particularly healthy situation for that cell. Um, I'm going to put up another picture. I didn't put this one in the slides. I don't know why. It also might not be like the most useful thing you've ever seen, so maybe that's why. But I'm going to show it to you anyway. I want not that. This and I want this. The antiviral state is basically setting up a situation like this. You have something bad going on. You have virus infecting some of your cells, like this forest fire. You want to protect your other cells and keep them healthy. So you might clear cut a little area. That's not exactly good for the forest to clear cut that area. But it's going to stop the forest from spreading, the, the fire from spreading and taking over everything. This is sort of what we're doing with the antiviral state. We're putting our cells in a state that's actually not that healthy for them, but that will block further spread of our viral infection to protect the entire organism. So we can't have those cells in the antiviral state permanently because that would be really bad for those cells. Um, so we can think about kind of one other piece to this lovely antiviral state problem as well. Um, so let's imagine that you have a cell that receives some interferon. What kind of, um, how healthy is that cell going to be? If you have a cell that gets some interferon? Not totally healthy. It stopped translation, it stopped transcription, right? It's kind of going to be not great. Okay, now let's imagine you as an organism. Let's imagine a bunch of your cells have interferon on them. Let's imagine you, your body starts making interferon, so a bunch of your cells are experiencing interferon. How are you going to feel? Not great, right? Would you, I don't know, maybe feel like you have a fever and chills and nausea and malaise? all the things people think of as sort of acute viral infection. So in fact, when your body is making a lot of interferon, you are start going to have these symptoms. Those symptoms are pretty much made following any viral infection. And this is why people often have quote unquote flu-like symptoms with so many viral infections, that fever and dizziness and just sort of blah feeling. That's because that's, you're making interferon. So a lot of people think of that as the flu. No, the flu actually has some pretty specific respiratory things, some pretty specific things that are going on. Um, you know, you, in some ways, it's like you have early virus. You don't know what virus it is, but it's, you don't have the flu. You have early something virus. So now let's think about one other kind of piece to the interferon system. If you were designing the interferon system, you can see my lovely interferon system here. Which cells of the body, what cell types in the body do you think should be able to make interferon? Which cells should be able to tell their neighbors about a virus? Yeah, Michael. 
pretty much all, you want every cell to be able to do this, right? If there's a virus anywhere, you want it to be able to be uh, messaged about. Which cells do you think should have an interferon receptor? Which cells should be listening for the message that there's a virus around? Yeah, pretty much all of them, right? All of your cells have interferon receptors, which means if you start making interferon, that's why you're going to feel like crap, <laughs> because all of your cells are going to start responding to this, and all of your cells are going to go into this un somewhat unhealthy antiviral state. I mean, it's amazing because it stops viral infection, but it also makes you want to take a nap. Um, one other thing that we know is that interferons um, can actually impact other types of immune responses. So usually when you start to make a lot of type 1 interferons, you inhibit some other parts of this classic bacterial inflammatory response. That's actually to try to limit how much damage your immune system can do at once. <laughs> um, but um, in fact, uh, what that means is that some people who have serious viral infections end up dying of bacterial infections that they got at the same time because their body can't fight both. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll answer your question and then I have another point. Go for it. I was just wondering if you're double checking. You're saying it's, 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 it's affirmative because it inhibits Christian and you can't transcribe cytokines. It, it actually specifically inhibits the cytokines. It specifically is like, okay, let's, let's, let's calm down the immune response. We don't have too much immune damage. Okay, so yeah, so, so basically, particularly this is the case with elderly people in the flu. People, they tend to die of bacterial pneumonia because their interferon is inhibiting their um, antibacterial response. Also realize, um, tomorrow, I have an appointment to get a flu shot. What is gonna happen tomorrow, that flu shot is going to have some um, aspect, some parts of influenza virus in it. What is going to happen to me when I get my flu shot? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be starting to make an immune response, but in fact, I'm going to make a little bit of interferon. If I really was motivated to measure interferon in my body tomorrow. I'm not that motivated. Um, I would find an increase in my interferon levels in the blood for about, within about the first 10 hours after I get that vaccine. Uh, I'm that's going to be helping some other parts of my adaptive immune response that are not shown here. But I might have this side effect of feeling a little bit poorly. Um, and it's all because of the interferons leading to this antiviral state. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to, I have kind of this other section of stuff that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm definitely not going to get through that in the other section in seven minutes. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk about it in big picture, and I will probably uh, do a bunch of it on Monday and just compress the other th topic that I wanted to talk about, which was kind of an experimental topic anyway that I'd never done before. So, that, so it has to be compressed. It has to be compressed. That's fine. Um, so the other topic that I want to talk a little bit about goes back to thinking about PRRs. So whenever we have talked about PRRs at this point, I've just said, there's a PRR. <laughs> there's a pattern recognition receptor. Um, but we can actually think more specifically about PRRs in terms of the types of PRRs and what they recognize and what they do, um, because there are some pretty interesting pieces to all of this. Um, so in general, we can divide up PRRs into groups. Um, this figure from a different immunology textbook shows some different groups of PRRs. I'm not going to use the exact groups that are on here, but this does kind of give us a big picture idea of some of the ideas of the groups. Um, 
They differ based on things like where they are. Are they on the surface? Hey, look, I drew this one on the surface. Or are they in the cytoplasm? Hey, look, I drew this one in the cytoplasm. Um, what they recognize and their general functions. But to fully understand this story, let's talk about this. And this is always really fun. I like this part. So we're going to talk about a gene. Um, and this gene has actually led to two Nobel Prizes. Does anybody here speak German? OK. What that means is that when I tell you um, some things about German, you, don't know, you won't know if I'm kind of like massaging my translation. Perfect. Um, so this gene was first discovered by some developmental biologists who were looking at Drosophila. They were looking at Drosophila embryos. Their goal was to try to find out how the embryo got to a point where it had a head versus a tail and a back versus a front. So it was something called dorsal ventral patterning in the, in the embryo. So that was what they were looking at, like how the embryo goes from being symmetrical to being asymmetrical. And they made a uh, this woman, Christiane nolstein Bullhart, made a bunch of mutant Drosophila and looked at the embryos under a microscope to see what was up. And with Drosophila that were missing this one gene, she looked in her microscope and she said, she was German, she said, Toll! I almost tripped. If I tripped, I would have said Toll. Um, my understanding. I have heard different people translate this for me. Um, the translations range from wow to oh shit. <laughs> so it's something of that general nature of an exclamation in German. Because she basically found fly embryos that didn't have a head versus a tail. They had stopped that ability to dorsal ventral pattern. And she won the Nobel Prize for this. Later on, some other scientists figured out a way to make flies that were adults who just didn't have toll when they were adults. So they developed into a normal fly. But then you could, they could look and see, does toll have a, a job in adults besides embryonic development? And when they did that, they found flies that looked like this. This is actually kind of a famous picture to immunologists. It was on the cover of a bunch of journals. Um, it also won a Nobel Prize. Um, where, and this Drosophila is covered with fungus. This is all fungus all over this fly. And this fly suffered from pretty massive fungal infection because it was missing toll. And they realized that toll also played this critical role in sensing uh, microbial infection. We have since found that there are a whole group of proteins that are like toll. Again, so creative. They were named the toll-like receptors because they were like toll or the TLRs. Um, they all have pretty similar uh, structures. So they have some part of them that can help them respond to the microbe. So this is going to actually uh, respond to or bind the MAMP, as well as some kind of um, domain uh, that is going to allow for signal transduction. Um, this domain that is involved in sensing microbes is called a leucine-rich repeat domain, or LRR. I mention it because there are some other proteins I will tell you about later that also have leucine-rich repeat domains. And I will say, have you ever heard of that before? And you will say, yes, of course, it was in the toll-like receptor. Um, so there are the leucine-rich repeats, and there are uh, a bunch of different domains that allow for signaling. We now know that there are lots of different types of TLRs um, in the human. Um, your textbook here is only showing up to uh, 10. We're actually up to 13 um, in the literature. 
Um, and we generally group them into two groups, some that live on the plasma membrane and some that live in the endosome. Um, and they even, they separate kind of into these two groups phylogenetically, they separate into these two groups in a lot of different ways. And so we will pick up on Monday, starting to think about the two groups of these TLRs and what is unique about the two groups and what they do. Um, so I will see you guys on Monday. Um, there won't be a specific reading for Monday. Uh, and I will send you an email tonight if we are going to have that um, assignment that will be due next week. So have a great weekend.